we've got our seal ring washer here and notice this side has a recess counter bore because the uh, um, the gear shaft extends beyond the uh, the bearing uh, race so I'm going to make sure that side goes down there's an o-ring that goes on here okay we're going to put that in with some grease in a minute and but before we do that we're going to put the seal in okay there's our seal we're going to pack this with grease before we do our final assembly we're going to put the seal in dry okay so we're trying to keep oil from getting out so the lip side goes toward the bearing so it goes this way okay guys I did not like that oil seal I ended up taking it back out and putting in a different brand <clears throat> all right yeah just it just the fit was not good I didn't like the way it lined up with the uh, with the sealing washer so we went with a different style okay there's our snap ring I'm gonna load that seal with some grease I do not like lithium grease okay I will only use synthetic grease I'm using a, a vacuum of grease for this it's just the closest thing for me to grab and then here's our washer so, and our brand new o-ring same thing I'm going to grease it up good all right we're over at the vise we got our u-joint assembly clamped in here we may have to move it around a little bit so our o-ring goes against this face here that's where we get our seal okay so this goes on like this get the spline started we got our cone washer goes in there and our hold down bolt um, there's a tiny bit of oil on here I don't want to put too much because we're going to end up loctiting this and I don't want to contaminate the loctite okay so there's no torque spec on this it's determined by your preload you tighten until you get the right preload on your bearings so it's a there is a, a way to measure it um, but it's I mean it's more of a feel thing than anything else okay, I'm going to get a little bit more okay that's feeling pretty good I'm going to take this out of here and spin it several times just to kind of seat everything in okay I'm liking that so now I'm going to take that back out Blue Loctite. Now the idea is to retighten it but not crush it anymore. Let's see how that feels. I'm going to give it just a tiny bit more. going until I can feel a slight change okay that's pretty tight all right we're gonna leave it right there Let's see what our preload feels like okay I'm happy with that 
Okay, we're to our next crucial step. So I've cleaned these bearings up a little bit. I got all the uh, permatex and, and stuff off the outside. So just a little uh, explanation of what we're looking at here. So we've got our one of our side gears. This is this happens to be the forward gear. It sits in the bottom of the transmission. And then this drive cup threads into the gear at the factory. There's, you don't take it apart in the field. It's a factory deal, okay? Uh, they have a between this cup and the gear, they have this little washer in here. Uh, its job is to keep the needle bearing <laughs> in place. It's a, it, it holds the needle bearing cage assembly. Okay, that's all it does. Okay, so then the bearing is pressed onto the gear. It's got a long stub shaft. And then there's an adapter here, fixture, that, that, that the outer race of the bearing is pressed into. So there's several parts here. Normally, we, we don't have to do anything with these other than clean them, okay? Um, now the cup here is another story. So this is where the one of the big shifting problems comes in. These cups get glazed. Let me just make sure you guys can see. And I, and I showed this before. See how shiny and glazed that is? Okay, so the, uh, the shifting cone relies on friction to, in, to engage that cup you know, to, to drive the drive output drive shaft, okay? And when they get glazed, it's too smooth. There's not, it's not getting a good grip. All right, so we're gonna deglaze that. We're just gonna use some fine valve lapping compound, just like a grease. Just take a little bit. And we're gonna coat the inside of this cup. Got a little too much here. Get a nice even coat all the way around, about like that. And then we're gonna, that's the bottom gear, the forward gear. So we're top here because we want to lap the side that it's gonna run on. Just drop that in there. Make sure it's fitting good. Two turns, three full turns. Okay, we don't want to do any more than we have to. Let's see how we're doing. This one's got a pretty good glaze on it, so I think we'll give it a little bit more. Okay, we'll get a couple more turns, a little more compound. Okay, you don't want to overdo this because you're, you know, we're actually wearing material off. And we want to make this last as long as we can. I'm going to go the other way. That's probably good. Okay, so we've knocked that shiny glaze off of there. That's perfect. There may be one little tiny bit of shiny still at the top edge here, but we, we don't want to overdo it. Okay, so we're going to leave it just like that. Now, switch to the other gear and do the same thing. Now remember this is the top gear, so I'm this time I'm going to use this side. Oh yeah, beautiful. Okay, so now what we're going to do is give these a thorough cleaning. We're going to clean off our Lapping compound with solvent, and then we're going to come back with soap and water, hot soap and water. Okay, this step is probably going to freak you guys out, but uh, trust me, 
an okay way to do this. <laughs> as long as you got compressed air available to dry these out. <clears throat> so, having your bearings clean is probably the most important thing, especially if you've had any kind of a failure. It only takes a little bit of dirt to destroy a bearing, especially if it's a hard material, like a chunk of a gear or part of another bearing. So if you've had any kind of a failure, it's uh, crucial to do this. Now this, this unit's been sitting on my workbench for at least a year, maybe longer. So it's had a lot of time to get exposed to dirt, even though I've had it wrapped up. So I don't want to take any chances. I want to make sure that everything is clean. Using the hottest water I can stand. Okay, so why don't I do this with solvent? Well, unless you've got a lot of solvent to waste, the idea is you want to just keep fresh fluid coming in here, pushing out any dirt. And you can feel when you're spinning your bearing, you know, if there's any dirt in there. Alright, I'm going to go blow this out really good with air. Then I'm going to blow squirt WD-40 or equivalent in there and blow it out several times. We're getting ready for reassembly, but before we start assembling, we want to verify our shim sizes. We kept track of them when we, when we did our disassembly. We've got them in Ziploc bags. We've got the sizes recorded. But just because that's the way they came out doesn't mean that they're right. So we're going to do the calculation and determine what's really needed. So in your service manual, I'm on page 20, the uh, process for determining your shim sizes starts right here. <laughs> starts here and ends way over here. <laughs> and essentially it's a giant word problem, okay? If you like word problems, you're going to love the manual, all right? So um, what I've done is I've converted that to just a regular mathematical formula, extrapolated it out, and it's still a pretty complicated formula. So rather than use this and, and have a uh, chance of making a mistake, um, I've created an Excel spreadsheet. So let me turn on the computer and we'll look at that. All right, before we can run the calculations, you're going to have to retrieve these numbers off of your off your housing. So we got a B87 and a C77. So you need to write those down. Now this one's also got, if I can find it, it's got an A97. Okay, they normally don't have that. I'm not sure what that's for. I'm thinking that it's probably for calculating the um, the pinion depth, but. Most, most of the time you won't have that number. But you're looking for the B87 and, and or whatever the B is. It's going to be B with some number and C, Charlie, with some number. Okay, you need to write those down. And then you need to look at your look at your gears. So I can I know this is the upper gear because of the larger wear pattern that matches the, the, uh, the, the nut that goes on top. And this one's etched with a minus 15, so you need to write that down. Okay, and then this is the lower one. It's got the smaller wear pattern from that washer that's underneath. There you go, minus 12. Okay, so we write all those numbers down. B goes with the up, upper, C goes with the lower. Okay, and I've already done the calc, but we're going to run it again. 
Okay, so let me zoom you guys in to the uh, laptop with the Excel spreadsheet and I'll show you how that works. And if you guys want a copy of this, just shoot me an email, I'll send you the Excel file. So here's our spreadsheet. All right, so we've got the forward gear. So on our forward gear right here, we had the uh, inspection number come in here and this is going to be minus 12 minus 12 okay and right here is our stamped C value on the housing was 77 plug that in 77 okay and then over here is our reverse gear okay reverse gear inspection value uh, we had a minus 15 Plug that in, minus 15. All right, come over here to our B value stamped on the housing. And that was 87. Let's plug that in, 87. And then just click anywhere to accept that. Okay, and it's already done the calculations for us. Okay, so here's our, our forward shim size comes out to 63 or 6.3 thousandths or 0.16 millimeters and then our reverse gear came out over here at 0 0.03 millimeters or 1.2 thousandths okay so they don't make a shim that small so essentially has no shim needed on that on the reverse gear okay anyways that's how you work the spreadsheet this is just a place where you can keep the model number. It doesn't do anything. Uh, and then here's the spot if you want to record the serial number, in case you want to print this out to throw in the job file or what have you. Okay. All right. Well, that's pretty much it. Okay. We're going to um, write these numbers down and continue on. All right. We've got our shim calculations all worked out. We've got the numbers written down here. Um, and... We're comparing to what we took out, which was uh, the, the lower had a five thousandths and a two thousandths, so that's seven thousandths. And our calculation came up with uh, 6.3 thousandths. So you're never going to hit it exactly, so that's pretty dang close. So we're, we're good with those. And then the upper um, had no shims, okay? <laughs> So our calc called for uh, 1.2 thousandths. I went through all my spare shims and looking for, you know, a, a one thousandth shim. Honestly, I've never seen a one thousandth shim. Usually two thousandths is about as skinny as they get. Uh, and so I don't have one. Um, and that didn't have one originally. So we're just going to put it back together the way we found it. And you know, one thousandths one way or the other isn't going to make that big of a difference because you have you're going to have uh, your normal backlash, which is going to give you clearance, anyways. Okay, um, yeah, I know I've spent a lot of time on this, but it's really, really important, guys, um, especially if you're working on one that's already been been serviced by somebody, you don't know if they if they got things mixed up or maybe they didn't have the right formula. You need to double check this, okay.